Good evening, everyone. If everyone could find their seats. Good evening, and welcome to the Smithsonian American Art Museum. I'm E. Carmen Ramos, curator of Latino art, and I'm very excited to welcome all of you and our webcast viewers to this first public program held in conjunction with Down These Mean Streets, Community in Place and Urban Photography. Our exhibition explores the life and times of the American city during moments of crisis and transformation through the work of 10 leading Latino photographers. Tonight's program offers a unique form of visual interpretation known as exphrastic poetry. This genre of poetry entails the imaginative act of narrating and reflecting on a work of art. The idea for our event started when I met renowned poet Martin Espada, son of Frank Espada, one of the artists included in our exhibition. Martin has written many compelling poems about his father's life and work. We thought it would be wonderful to not only uh, invite him to share his poetry with their audience, but to also invite other poets to reflect on the work presented in Down These Mean Streets. DC-based poets Naomi Ayala and Sammy Miranda are also joining us tonight, presenting new works that they've written directly in response to the works in our exhibition. Uh, I've just seen a tiny preview of what we'll hear tonight, and I'm really very excited about what, uh, what we're all gonna hear. I want to thank our partner, Professor Francisco Aragon, who runs Letras Latinas, a literary initiative of the, at the University of Notre Dame's Institute of Latino Studies. We've worked together in the past on poetry programs inspired by our Latino collection, and I'm very excited to be collaborating again with his program. Um, I'll introduce our poets, and then they will come on stage and present their work, uh, accompanied by slides. Following the poetry reading, uh, you're all invited to a small reception in the lobby of our auditorium where we can engage with our presenters directly. And here's a little bit about our poets. Naomi Ayala is the author of three books of poetry, Wild Animals on the Moon, This Side of Early, and Calling Home, Praise Songs and Incantations. She's also the translator of Luis Alberto Ambrosio's book, the, Wind, the Wind's Archaeology, La Archaeología del Viento, which won an International Latino Book Award for Best Nonfiction Book Translation. She lives in Washington, D.C., where she teaches poetry and memoir to English language learners at the Carlos Rosario School as a founding teacher of the Write Who You Are program. Samuel Miranda grew up in the South Bronx and has made his home in Washington, D.C. He is a visual artist, poet, and teacher who uses his craft to highlight the value of everyday people and places. His work has been heavily influenced by Puerto Rican culture and family history, as well as, inter as his interactions with his city, his students, and the people he encounters in his travels. His poetry has been published in anthologies and journals, and he's performed at venues such as the National Museum of African Art and the Kennedy Center. Martin Espada was born in Brooklyn, New York. He has published 20 books as a poet, editor, essayist, and translator. His latest collection of poems is called Vivas to Those Who Have Failed. His honors include the Shelley Memorial Award, the National Hispanic Cultural Center Literary Award, and a Guggenheim Fellowship. His book of essays, Zapata's Disciple, was banned in Tucson as part of the Mexican American Studies program outlawed by the state of Arizona. A former tenant uh, lawyer in greater Chicago's Latino community, Espada is a professor of English at the University of Ma Massachusetts Amherst. And before we start, a quick reminder to please silence your devices. Thank you and enjoy the program and I welcome Sammy Miranda to the stage. Hello. Buenas noches, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about our process before we get started, because we kind of came into this because we really like working together, right? So 
this was an opportunity for us to do that and then share the work with folks. So, um, yeah, I met Sammy uh, when I got uh, coerced by him and his wife to move to Washington, D.C. from Connecticut, and that's how I ended up here. Um, so they're very close friends. And I first met Sammy as a teacher. So our first connection was through education, then poetry, his wonderful photographs, and now painting. So this was a very special project for us to be able to share, and that spanned two, two and a half, three months now. Yep. Um, and some things you should know. So we'll read some separate, some poems separately, and then we'll conclude with a poem that's actually in two voices. Um, and in terms of the process, we really started looking at the images a while back and thinking about, for me, it was what touched the memory, because a lot of the images are actually taken in the space I grew up. So a lot of the writing I'm doing is very much narrative um, and, is t and taps into what the photos touched on in terms of my own memory. And then we started having those discussions and you were in Hartford. I, I was New in Haven. Hartford, so, and I've known, uh, actually after meeting Martine when I was about eight year, 18 years old, uh, knowing his father's work in um, our community. Um, he's absolutely famous. And there wasn't probably a, a march or a protest that didn't bear one of his photographs in one flyer or another. So he was seen as, as a photographer and artist of the people. Right. You want to get to it? Yes, sir. Mom. All right, so we're going to start out with... Buscando oh. un árbol. Buscando un árbol que me de sombra. And the images that you see on here are the images that triggered whatever conversations or memories we like came to. Okay? And the, the poem starts with actually a, um, a chorus from a song that's sung in bomba. And bomba's Puerto Rican, Afro Puerto Rican music that calls for drummers, dancers, song and is really a conversation in and of itself. And the, um, the chorus, I'm gonna read it in Spanish. Estoy buscando un árbol que me de sombra, porque el que tengo me lo van a cortar. I'm looking for a tree to give me shade because the one I have, they're gonna cut it down. All right? So this is buscando un árbol que me de sombra. This building stands, the last tree to be cut down in a garden of brick and steel, made desert of rubble and dust. It still shelters families whose poverty bites into them like the rats that chew holes into their cereal boxes and gnaw at their toes. It spits out children to play on mattresses already evicted by flame and smoke, then swallows them back in after streetlights remind mothers to call for their return. It provides shade for the mangy dogs who scavenge through the leftovers of the leftovers and then wait below the window of the woman who leans out and like a merenguero playing guido, scrapes her plate clean, letting each drop of food fall within reach. This being the last tree Aboricua is born from the roots up to study the light of the universe. The earth's drum imbuing feet with rhythms only the wind can carry, only another Boricua knows. He is given the cycles of the land he broke with for a different kind of freedom. They are heavy, sour sop bombing the rubble with milky sweetness to spite the window panes, this sky that can take us. They joined his mind against the city like the nodes of sugar cane. This being the last tree, his laughter bounding from the last airport of his imagination, another Boricua is born of it from the roots up. The next piece is from an image taken by Perla de Leon um, called Pepe and Me. 
and it's the one that's there. And for me, the, the trigger around it were the following lines. I'm going to read them out to you because they're in and of themselves are just pretty, right? So maybe they didn't understand. They were taking a part of my life with them. My house still stands broken and empty as I walk by. I can still see my door where my mother closed her eyes for the last time. This piece is called Departure. It's something that Puerto Ricans know a lot about. Um, and I think with the situation in Puerto Rico right now, with the exodus that's occurring from the island, um, and the, I've stood on blocks where, just like in Detroit and some of the other cities in the US, they're completely devoid of people, right? And the houses just stand there. So this piece is called Departure, and it's thinking about those particular spaces. This is what remains. Eyes that have watched how departure returns. The stories have been stored in wrinkles, deepened by the exodus of youth. Those who stay sit on gated porches, blocking the exits. Empty houses are for sale. Memories get lost in the transaction. The cats have found the porch, decorating it with their leavings. Everything else, gone. For me, um, this piece elicited a lot of memories. And I remember my grandfather used to keep little books like this, ca calendars or agendas in those days were imprinted with the date on them. Um, and the fact that you can carry them in your pocket was always an, an attractive thing to me, um, even when I was very little. Um, it also made me think the connection in, in this to loss um, is, is triggered here in this journal entry by a, a tree in front of the house that gets cut down. Um, and that um, elicited this piece called the object memory, um, the subject of some conversations that Sammy and I have had because in our collaborating on this, both of us started to have a lot of memories around objects. So the poem is in five pieces. Refajo is a, a, a slip, a long slip that comes down to your knees. Um, Colija is um, the ash of a cigarette. The refajo sits in the hot tin tub by the creek. Apurate a comer. Apurate, nena. Soursop pounding the ground. The Museo de las Artesanías Naturales. The Museum of Me. The colija, three fingers long, he has fallen asleep with all the lights on. Work after work after work. Airplane boarded, devoid of speech, muted, the suffered muting. America, land of, tu no sabes inglés. Tu no sabes. All right, lechon. So people who know me know that lechon is a part of my year, something I look forward to, right? Um, but it's also, again, when I look at the images, for some folks, these images are just like, I, I, I like to connect to it, it's, it's there. When I'm looking at them, it's like, I'm going back, right? Because that's where I grew up, OK? Um, so Lechon, carcass beside a carcass, one of metal, one of flesh, both waiting to be scavenged, one by men who become adept at removing things that serve no purpose where they sit and turning them into a working part and an extra dollar. The other, by the children who stand like crows congregating near roadkill to wait for a piece of cuerito <laughs> that they can peel right off. 
machete en la capota. The hand that grips its hilt will slide through flesh and bone of the roasting animal. Or el animal who doesn't understand. The sharp edge of a machete will cut the guapo right out of you. Carcass beside a carcass, proving that the dead serve a purpose. And the living will congregate anywhere that the smell of well-seasoned meat fills the air enough to house the memory of home. Even when home is only a story that your mother tells you while she sits in a house dress, hair rolled, wrapped around rollers, feet slipped into chanclas, and plant firmly on ground she can't root into because here only weeds take root and she is a flamboyant. Thunder. Thunder skips across the sky, a Morse code drawing near. Wild wind and rain, smothering rain, the staggering drunks leave their already empty posts. Their hats hail, all the world's hail, and the curbstone river lights in a hundred square windows smudged into the black. All that needs it, muffled, all that wants, and then dawn, a single mockingbird. Hydrant. Hands gripping wrench pull back, let loose the force of water meant to put out fires, creating a wave that can be guided with hands or can, and answers the call of children who, feeling the heat of summer, trapped by cinder block walls and transferred onto their skin, run to La Pompa, where force plus water plus hands transform gutters into riverbeds, emptying into the mouths of sewers and crowded with paper boats, floated to see if they could travel the distance between pump and corner without capsizing. Um, for me, in it being a part of this collaboration and in looking forward to, he, to being lucky enough to hear another one of uh, Martine's readings and to, to be able to look at all the pieces in this exhibit, I, I can't do it without thinking about my old friend, the incredible uh, Jack Agueros, an incredibly talented <laughs> poet and short story writer. And, uh, very dear friend of Martin's and his dad, Frank. Um, so this poem called Chair in the Snow is dedicated to Jack. Here in the cold pile and dark clutter, I have made room for you. Come, before the light leaks out of the world, before my words, tita, bitin, pepito, freeze off from me, before the foothold of sleep before the pillared darkness lays me flat on myself, gasping for air, I reach up from the crusted snow, the bellowing stillness, here in the day's refracted light, come sit at the edge of the world. Lessons for my daughter about playing domino. Aguántala para que aprenda. I am the one who wraps himself around you like a hand around a feature. I sit here so you can learn. The numbers are not surprises. There's always an order to them. Men make the choices that cause them to seem out of place. Know that for men at a domino table, a smile may hide a disappointment a hand lacking potential, a life lacking opportunity, and quickly turn into a threat. Watch the ones who stand behind you. Watch where their eyes land. You never know what they see. 
or the message they convey when they look away. Heed the warning on the wall to stop the bullshit. But know the difference between that and shit talking. Let loose the shit talking. So they never know when a kabigu is going to get slammed onto the table. Mirror, mirror, I don't know why the overcast sky's grown a solid wall and pink at that. It might snow this late in April or it's an omen and I'll get to live another 20 years to see all the lovely times of cold, hard rain, but pink isn't my color, really. Those storms love to see me coming, wondering rain fool that I am here, so past dusk in the district, past everything present, pitch gray and pink tint, and the cars buzzing on by as if the world were on fire and eternal at the same time. Oh, the myopic stars, the unimaginable O's, the rain, stillness. <clears throat> So one of the things that we figured out really quickly when we started looking at the images is that you gotta look at things over and over and over again, right? And not only over and over and over again, but you gotta look at the details. In every one of the images in the show, there's details that come out only if you really take the time to examine them. So we were playing around with some of the details that we were seeing in this one. And this image is a perfect example of that. I mean, I love them all, we love them all, but this was one that started uh, this incredible dialogue. They're amazing windows, so if you've seen it already, we invite you to go back and take a second look. Caserita. This is how we remember we're going to die when everything conspires in favor of forgetting the same drunk, insolente, so and so turning a trick, the corner you love to hate. Watch that kid play, watch that kid play. The Pentecostal minister warns, evita la del piso cinco, espiritista. Evítate esto y esto y esto y esto, y a la fulana de tal también, por si las moscas. Look at how she stands at the window, arms crossed, Pillow waiting for her to lean onto the ledge and call up her next victim. A curse is waiting on you there. You can smell the devil from down the hall. <laughs> Just behind the scent of urine that's been soaked up by tiled hallways and brick walls. Evítate las malas apariencias y verte demasiado pobre y el mal de ojo también. Y esto, y esto, y esto, y esto. En casa evita a gabán for papá. Or a guayabera. Something that he can put on when he stands on the rooftop that will make him look like the dollars he earned stretch far enough to fill an empty fridge. En mi tienda, a bata to send mamita. A house dress covered in palm fronds that she will wear as she sweeps the sidewalk in front of the cement house her sons built for her with money earned in a city where nothing seems to take root. And palms are just paintings on the bodega's roll-down gates. How can trees live here, you ask, wishing for a palm tree, the poison-free morning susurro? Is this a bachata upstairs? No, nah, this is not a bachata. This is not a anything. When sound breaks loose, it looks for the open window, makes the curtains choose between a boogaloo swing and that step, the horn section of a good salsa tune makes you take. They always choose the horns. Catch on, mano. Olvídate de eso. What is the color of forgetting? Salsa, papito. Salsa from upstairs. Y la mecedora rocking away the harsh, dry world. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
Buenas noches. Uh, I am indeed Martinez Pada. And um, there are um, some people that I want to thank. Uh, tonight, first of all, I want to thank uh, Carmen Ramos. I want to thank Cara Fixi. Uh, I want to thank my wonderful friends and fellow poets, Naomi Ayala and Semi Miranda. Please give them another hand. There are many people here tonight who are near and dear to me. Um, I, I want to recognize um, my mother, Marilyn Espada, and my brother, Jason Espada, out here. And um, I, I want to thank my brother especially because he has been instrumental in the acquisition of my father's work by the Smithsonian. Uh, give him a hand again. Uh, Eduardo Lopez, my father's lab assistant, is here tonight. Eduardo. And so too is James Early, who uh, was uh, the person who uh, gave my father his first grant, a National Endowment for the Humanities grant. And may that not be a thing of the past. Please recognize James Early. And I want to thank Frank Espada, uh, my father. Uh, he was born in Tuala, Puerto Rico in 1930. He died in Pacifica, California in 2014. Frank Espada was a community organizer. He was a civil rights activist. He was a leader, many people would say the leader, of the Puerto Rican community in New York City in the 1960s and early 1970s. He was, of course, also a documentary photographer and the creator of the Puerto Rican Diaspora Documentary Project, a photo documentary and oral history of the Puerto Rican migration. He was also my father, and I am especially tonight very proudly my father's son. And that's us. That's me and him, I'm the little one. <laughs> the year was 1964. I was seven years old, and that photograph was taken by my mother, who is a fine photographer in her own right. I think she should have a show here. <laughs> um, but this photograph appears behind me as I read this first poem, for a specific reason. This was the beginning at the age of seven of my awareness of my father as an activist. And it began when he disappeared and I was sure he was dead. This poem is called The Sign in My Father's Hands for Frank Espada. The beer company did not hire blacks or Puerto Ricans. So my father joined the picket line at the Schaefer Beer Pavilion New York World's Fair amid the crowds glaring with canine hostility. But the cops brandished nightsticks and handcuffs to protect the beer, and my father disappeared. In 1964, I had never tasted beer, and no one told me about the picket signs torn in two by the cops of brewery. I knew what dead was. Dead was a cat overrun with parasites and dumped in the hallway incinerator. I knew my father was dead. I went mute and filmy-eyed, the slow boy who did not hear the question in school. I sat studying his framed photograph like a mirror, my darker face. Days later, he appeared in the doorway, grinning with his gilded tooth. Not dead, 
though I would come to learn that sometimes Puerto Ricans die in jail with bruises no one can explain, swelling their eyes shut. I would learn, too, that boycott is not a boy's haircut, <laughs> that I could sketch a picket line on the blank side of a leaflet. That day, my father returned from the netherworld easily as riding the elevator to apartment 14F and the brewery cops could only watch in drunken disappointment. I searched my father's hands for a sign of the miracle. That man's name is Agrobino Bonillo. My father photographed him in 1965. My father at the time did not know his name. Years later, we would find out that Agrobino Bonillo was the same man who was murdered only a year later in the East New York section of Brooklyn in 1966. My father organized with local clergy a candlelight march and vigil to the site of the murder, to the place where Agro Pino Bonillo met his end. I remember being part of that march. I remember being part of that candlelight vigil. This was also part and parcel of my education. 1966, I was nine. It's not something you forget, and I didn't. And years later, I would write this poem. It's called The Moon Shatters on Alabama Avenue. A wooden box rattled with coins for the family. On a stoop where the roots of a brown bloodstain grew. Brooklyn, 1966. Agropino Bonillo was his name. A neighbor, the yellow leaflet said. A kitchen worker who walked home under the scaffolding of the trains at night, hurrying past street lamps with dark eyes. He was there when the boys surrounded him, quick with shouts and pushing addiction's hunger in a circle. When he had no money, the kicking began. The mourners clustered at the storefront, then marched between cadaverous buildings down Alabama Avenue as the night turned blue with rain in a heavy sky of elevated track. The first candles struggled, smothered, wet. Onlookers leaned warily as they watched. A community of faces gathered and murmured in the dim circles of light, kept alive by cupped hands. In the asphalt street, polished black by rain, and windows where no one was seen, hesitant candles appeared. A pale blur started on the second floor. Another trembling glimmer slipped to the back of the march. Then more, multiplied into a constellation spreading over the sidewalk. A swarm of candles that throbbed, descending tenement steps in the no longer absolute dark, as if the moon had shattered and dropped in burning white pieces on the night. His name was Agropino Bonillo. Spoken, remembering every $60 week, he was bent in the kitchen, his children who could not dress for winter, and brawled against welfare taunts at the schoolyard, the unlit night that the sweep of legs was stopped by his belly and his head. And the grief of thousands illuminated city blocks moving with the tired feet of the poor, Candles, a reminder of the wakes too many and too soon. The frustrated prayers and pleading with saints in memoriam for generations of sacrificed blood, warm as the wax sticking to their fingers. And years of broken street lamps bowed with dark eyes where addiction's hunger waits nervously. Over the wooden box, a woman's face was slick in a drizzle of tears. Her hand dropped coins like seed.
And that is Jack Agueros. And that is really Jack Agueros, because that photograph captures his spirit perfectly. Um, you heard from Naomi about Jack Agueros. Jack Agueros was indeed a poet. He was a translator. He was an essayist. He was the director of El Museo del Barrio, uh, the only Puerto Rican museum in East Harlem, um, anywhere in the United States. And it was there that my father had his first real show. It was called Faces of the 60s. And some of the photographs in the exhibit here were photographs that originally appeared in Faces of the 60s. Jack Agueros was my father's close friend. He was also one of my father's favorite subjects. There are any number of Jack Agueros portraits. This is my particular favorite. Um, Jack was diagnosed ultimately with Alzheimer's <coughs> disease, and a bunch of us got together to organize a benefit for Jack um, in the neighborhood, East Harlem, where he grew up and where he went to school. Um, I wrote this poem for the occasion. It was about the first time I met Jack Agueros. Um, it's called, Blessed Be the Truth Tellers, for Jack Agueros. In the projects of Brooklyn, everyone lied. My mother used to say, if somebody starts a fight, just walk away. Then somebody would smack the back of my head and dance around me in a circle, laughing. When I was 12, pus bubbled on my tonsils, and everyone said, after the operation, you can have all the ice cream you want. I bragged about the deal. No longer would I chase the ice cream truck down the street, panting at the bells to catch Johnny, the ice cream man, who allegedly sold heroin the color of vanilla from the same window. <laughs> then, Jack, the truth teller, visited the projects. Jack, who herded real camels and sheep through the snow of East Harlem every Three Kings Day. Jack, who wrote sonnets of the jail cell and the racetrack and the boxing ring. Jack, who crossed his arms in a hunger strike until the mayor hired more Puerto Ricans. And Jack said, you are gonna get your tonsils out? Ay, bendito coochie frito, Puerto Rico. That's gonna hurt. <laughs> I was etherized, then woke up on the ward heaving black water onto white sheets. A man poking through his hospital gown leaned over me and sneered, You think you got it tough? Look at this, and showed me the cauliflower tumor behind his ear. I heaved up black water again. <laughs> the ice cream burned. Vanilla was a snowball spiked with bits of glass. My throat was red as a tunnel on fire after the head-on collision of two gasoline trucks. This is how I learned to trust the poets and shepherds of East Harlem. Blessed be the truth tellers, for they shall have all the ice cream they want. <laughs> that man's name is Jose Acuña. Jose Acuña was the director of something called the Manhattan Valley Development Corporation. He was a community organizer who was working uh, on behalf of the victims of arson for profit, which was rampant in the Manhattan Valley in the early 1980s, and which was the subject of uh, a photo essay by my father. Uh, it was the summer of 1981. I was working with my father, and in fact, I was there when this photograph was taken, just outside the frame. I was carrying the camera bags and the tape recorder, and I had a little bit of hair on my chin. I was 23. 
Um, I was so moved by what Jose Acuna told us, by what my father documented, that I wrote a poem almost immediately afterward. And here's the poem now. It's called Mrs. Baez Serves Coffee on the Third Floor. It hunches with her brittle black spine where they poured gasoline on the stairs and the banister and burnt it. The fire went running down the steps, a naked lunatic calling the names of the neighbors, cackling in the hall. The immigrants ate terror with their hands and prayed to Catholic statues as the fire company pumped a million gallons in and burst the roof as an old man on the top floor with no name known to authorities strangled on the smoke and stopped breathing. Some of the people left. There's a room on the third floor. High-heeled shoes kicked off. A broken dresser, the saint's portrait hanging where it looked on shrugging shoulders for years. Soot, trash, burnt tile, a perfect black light bulb to remember everything. And some stayed. The old men bare-chested squatting on the milk crates to play dominoes in the front stoop sun. The younger ones, the tigres, watching the block with unemployed faces bitter as bad liquor. Mrs. Bias, who serves coffee on the third floor from tiny porcelain cups insisting that we stay. The children who live between narrow kitchens and charred metal doors and laugh anyway. The skinny man, the one just arrived from Santo Domingo, who cannot read or write, with no hot water for six weeks, telling us in the hallway that the landlord set the fire and everyone knows it. The building's worth more empty. The street organizers said it. Burn the building out blacken an old Dominicano's lungs and sell so that the money people can renovate and live here where an old Dominicano died over the objections of his choking spirit. But some have stayed. Stayed for the malicious winter. Stayed frightened of the white man who comes to collect rent and borrowing from cousins to pay it. Stayed waiting for the next fire and the siren hysterical and late. Someone poured gasoline on the steps outside her door. But Mrs. Baez still serves coffee in porcelain cups to strangers. Coffee the color of a young girl's skin in Santo Domingo. That's me with my son. Clemente. Uh, my father was always very good at photographing children. My son was about two years old at the time. He is now 25 years old, and he is six foot seven. <laughs> That's what happens when you feed them. <laughs> um, this next poem is about three generations. My father, me, my son, and the changes that happen without our even realizing it. Of the threads that connect the stars, for Clemente. Did you ever see stars? Asked my father with a cackle. He was not speaking of the heavens, but the white flash in his head when a fist burst between his eyes. In Brooklyn, this would cause men and boys to slap the table with glee. This might be the only heavenly light we'd ever see. I never saw stars. The sky in Brooklyn was a tide of smoke rolling over us from the factory across the avenue, the mattresses burning in the junkyard, the ruins where squatters would sleep, the riots of 1966 that kept me locked in my room like a suspect. My father talked truce on the streets. My son can see the stars with a tall barrel of a telescope. He names the galaxies with the numbers and letters of astronomy. 
I cannot see what he sees in the telescope, no matter how many eyes I shut. I understand a smoking mattress better than the language of galaxies. My father saw stars. My son sees stars. The earth rolls beneath our feet. We lurch ahead, and one day we have walked this far. That's my father, handsome devil, 1973. He had that Dorian Gray thing going on. <laughs> um, and yet this is an image that haunts me in a way, and I'll tell you why. Um, my father died three years ago, this past February. and. Um, the last three poems I'm going to read you are all about uh, his death and uh, the life that preceded it. Uh, they are included in a series in my most recent book, Viva Us to Those Who Have Failed. This next poem uh, is about a ceremony. It's a ceremony that should be familiar to anyone who's ever lost a parent. It's the ceremony of going through the stuff. Right? Going through the stuff. And it looks like junk until you come across the treasure. And of course, it's treasure only to you. In my case, the treasure consisted of two yellow Kodak boxes marked Puerto Rico, Noche Buena, December 1968. Uh, they were uh, eight millimeter silent movies. My mother sent them to me. And uh, had them burned onto a disc so I could watch the seven minutes of film, silent film. And I watched again and again and again and again. And I saw my father looking like that. This poem is called Haunt Me for My Father. I am the archaeologist. I sift the shards of you, cufflinks, Passport photos, a button from the March on Washington with a black hand shaking a white hand, letters in Spanish, your birth certificate from a town high in the mountains. I cup your silence, and the silence melts like ice in a cup. I search for you in two yellow Kodak boxes marked Puerto Rico, Nochebuena, December 1968. In the eight Millimeter silence, the espadas gather, elders born before the Spanish-American War. My grandfather on crutches after fracturing his fossil hip, his blind brother on a cane. You greet the elders and they call you Tato, the name they call you there. Uncles and cousins sing in a chorus of tongues without sound, vibration of guitar strings stilled by an unseen hand, maraca shaking empty of seats. The camera wobbles from the singers to the television and the astronauts sending pictures of the moon back to Earth. Down by the river, women still pound laundry on the rocks. I am 11 again. A boy from the faraway city of ice that felled my grandfather, startled after the blind man with the cane stroked my face with his hand dry as straw, crying out, Bendito. At the table, I hear only the silence that rises like the river in my big ears. You sit next to me, clowning for the camera, tugging the lapels on your jacket, slicking back your black hair, brown skin darker from days in the sun. You slide your arm around my shoulder, your good right arm, your pitching arm, and my moon face radiates, and the mountain song of my uncles and cousins plays in my head. Watching you now, my face stings as it stung when my blind great uncle brushed my cheekbone searching for his own face. When you died, Tato, 
I took a razor to the movie looping in my head, cutting the scenes where you curled an arm around my shoulder, all the times you would squeeze the silence out of me so I could hear the cries and songs again. When you died, I heard only the silences between us, the shouts belling the air before the phone went dead, all the words melting like ice in a cup. That way, I could set my jaw and take my mother's hand at the mortuary, greet the elders in my suit and tie at the memorial, say all the right words. Yet, my face stings at last. I rewind and watch your arm drape across my shoulder over and over. A year ago, you pressed a Kodak slide of my grandfather into my hand and said, Next time, stay longer. Now, in the silence that is never silent, I push the chair away from the table and say to you, sit down, tell me everything, haunt me. Two more. Um, this image behind me is the single most iconic image of the Puerto Rican diaspora documentary project. Uh, Naomi earlier was referring to the photographs of my father's that turn up at demonstrations. Well, this is it. Um, young man with a Puerto Rican flag is part of the collection here at the American uh, Art Museum. Um, and it's one of eight photographs to which I refer in the following poem. This is a poem about my father, the photographer, my father, the artist. Um, the artist is advocate. Um, the Puerto Rican diaspora documentary project almost did not exist. Many people told him he couldn't do it. Influential people, people like Cornell Kappa, famous photographer who said to him, no one wants to look at pictures of Puerto Ricans, Frank. My father used to repeat that phrase over and over again for motivation. He would say it to me, even though I'd heard the story many times. You know the way parents are? He would say, you know what Cornell Kappa said to me? Huh? <laughs> huh? Eh? Eh? No, what? <laughs> no one wants to look at pictures of Puerto Ricans, Frank. Well, as you know, my father's work is now included in the collections of the Smithsonian uh, American Art Museum, the Smithsonian American History Museum, the National Portrait Gallery, and the Library of Congress. So this is a poem called Mad Love. As I said, it references a number of his photographs. You've seen a couple of them already, the uh, Agropino Bonillo photograph, the Jack Agueros photograph, and this photograph of the man with the Puerto Rican flag. The title comes from um, a 1934 uh, horror movie with uh, Peter Lorre. It's insane and wonderful, and I recommend it. Um, this poem comes with an epigraph, too, and I'll bet you can imagine what it is. Mad love. No one wants to look at pictures of Puerto Ricans, Frank. <laughs> Cornell Kappa. My brother said they harvested his corneas. I imagine the tweezers lifting the corneas from my father's eyes delicate as the wings of butterflies mounted under glass. I imagine the transplant stitches finer than hair, eyes fluttering awake to the brilliance of an open window. This is not 
a horror movie. This is not Peter Lorre in Mad Love, the insane and jealous surgeon grafting the hands of a killer onto the forearms of a concert pianist who fumbles with the keys of the piano, flings knives with lethal aim, moonlight sonata swept away by lust for homicide, his wife shrieking. The blind will see like the captain of the slave ship who turned the ship around. Voices in the room will praise the Lord for the miracle, yet the eyes drinking light through my father's eyes will not see the faces in the lens of his camera, faces of the faceless waking in the dark room, not the tomato picker with a picket sign on his shoulder that says Reagan steals from the poor and gives to the rich. Not the fry cook in his fedora, staring at air as if he knew he would be stomped to death on the stoop for an empty wallet. Not the poet in a beret grinning at the vision of shoes for all the shoeless people on the earth. Not the dancer hearing the piano tell her to spin and spin again. Not the grave digger and his machete, the bandana that keeps the dust of the dead from coating his tongue. Not the union organizer, spirits floating in the smoke of his victory cigar. Not the addict in rehab gazing at herself like a fortune teller gazing at the cards. Not the face half hidden by the star in the Puerto Rican flag, the darkness of his dissident's eye. Now that my father cannot speak, they wait their turn to testify in his defense, witnesses to the mad love that drove him to it. And I'll finish my reading with this. Thank you for listening. And we'll be out there in the lobby afterwards. The screen is dark. And that is quite deliberate. This last poem is an elegy for my father, who is gone. Where is he? This is the poem I wrote for and read at his memorial service at El Puente Community Center in the Williamsburg section of Brooklyn uh, in May of 2014. It's called El Moribibi. And some of you know what that is. A Moribibi is a weed, pantropical weed. Uh, in Spanish, it literally means that term, I died, I lived. And the moribibi, of course, if you, you touch the leaves, they curl up. But then they uncurl again. The sun goes down, they curl up. And then at dawn, they uncurl again. Moribibi, moribibi. And here I had found it. I had found a metaphor to describe, to capture the many lives, the many deaths, and the many rebirths of Frank Espada, because trust me, he is here with us right now. And this is the poem with which I will finish. El Moribibi, in memoriam Frank Espada, 1930 to 2014. The Spanish means I died, I lived. In Puerto Rico, the leaves of El Moribibi close in the dark and open at first light. The fronds curl at a finger's touch and then unfurl again. My father, a mountain born of mountains, the tallest Puerto Rican in New York, who scraped doorways, who could crack the walls with the rumble of his voice, kept Amoribibi growing in his ribs. He would die, then live. My father spoke in the tongue of El Moribibi, teaching me the parable of Joe Fleming, who screwed his lit cigarette into the arms of the spicks he caught, flapping like fish 
My father was a bony boy, the nerves in his back crushed by the ILO Coal and Ice Company, the load he lifted up too many flights of stairs. Three times they would meet to brawl for a crowd after school. The first time my father opened his eyes to gravel and the shoes of his enemy. The second time he rose and dug his arm up to the elbow in the monster's belly. So badly did he want to tear out the heart and eat it. The third time Fleming did not show up. And the boys with cigarette burns clapped their spindly champion on the back all the way down the street. Fleming would become a cop, fired for breaking bones in too many faces. He died smoking in bed, a sheet of flame up to his chin. There was a Mori BV sprouting in my father's chest. He would die, then live. He spat obscenities like sunflower seeds at the driver who told him to sit at the back of the bus in Mississippi, then slipped his cap over his eyes and fell asleep. He spent a week in jail, called it the best week of his life, strode through the jailhouse door and sat behind the driver of the bus on the way out of town, his Air Force uniform all that kept the noose from his neck. He would come to know the jailhouse again among hundreds of demonstrators ferried by police to Hart Island on the East River where the city of New York stacks the coffins of anonymous and stillborn bodies. Here, Confederate prisoners once wept for the stars and bars. Now the prisoners sang freedom songs. The jailers outlawed phone calls, so we were sure my father must be a body like the bodies rolling water logged in the East River till he came back from the island of the dead, black hair combed meticulously. When the riots burned in Brooklyn night after night, my father was a peacemaker on the corner with a megaphone. A fiery chunk of concrete fell from the sky and missed his head by inches. My mother would tell me, your father is out dodging bullets. He spoke at a rally with Malcolm X in cantatory words, billowing through the bundled crowd, lifting hands and faces. Teach, they cried. My father clicked a photograph of Malcolm as he bent to hear a question, finger pressed against the chin. Two months later, the assassin stampeded the crowd to shoot Malcolm, blood leaping from his chest as he fell. My father would die too, but then he would live again. After every riot, every rally, every arrest, every night in jail, the change from his pockets landing hard on the dresser at 4 a.m. every time I swore he was gone for good. My father knew the secrets of El Mori Bibi, that he would die, then live. He drifted off at the wheel, drove into a guardrail, shook his head, and walked away without a web of scars or fractures. He passed out from the heat in the subway, toppled onto the tracks, and somehow missed the third rail. He tied a white apron across his waist to open a grocery store, pulled a revolver from the counter to startle the gangsters demanding protection, then put up signs for a clearance sale as soon as they backed out the door with their hands in the air. When the family finally took a vacation in the mountains of the Hudson Valley, a hotel with waiters in white jackets and white paint peeling in the room, the roof exploded in flame as if the ghost of Joe Fleming and his cigarette trailed us everywhere. And it was then that my father appeared in the smoke like a general leading the charge in battle, shouting commands at the volunteer fire company, steering the water from the hoses since he was in immune to death by fire or water, as if he wore the crumbled leaves of El Moribibi in an amulet slung around his neck. My brother called to say El Moribibi was gone. My father tore at the wires, the electrodes, the IV, saying that he wanted to go home. The hospital was a jailhouse in Mississippi. The furious pulse that fired his heart in every fight flooded the chambers of his heart. 
The doctor scrutinized the film, the grainy shadows and the light, but could never see. My father was a mori vivi. I died. I lived. He died. He lived. He dies. He lives. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much.